His name is Master. That's what we say. And if He is indeed our Master, then we turn to His Word and we say, Okay, Master, what, what do you have for us to hear? And so I invite you this morning to open up to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3. It's toward the back of the, the Bible, toward the back of the New Testament. The Apostle Peter is writing to the churches, to Christians, and we're in 1 Peter chapter 3. Um, let's pray together. Lord God, we do thank you that you are our master. You are our savior. We Open up our hearts, Lord, today before your word, and we say, Master, have your way with us. Lord, we're we're not here for you to tell us what is so good about us, because we know that your word honestly tells us the message is what is so good about you. And so help us to place ourselves in the proper order Underneath you, our living God, as your followers. And we ask that in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. See my buddy Willie sitting in the front row here. And whenever I see Willie, I think of the Pittsburgh Steelers. I was yesterday, we were out in the Pittsburgh area visiting our daughter at college. And there were Steelers bumper stickers everywhere. And I thought, well, at least for one week, for one week, the Steelers, if I said to Willie, Willie, the Eagles won last week. The Steelers look sick. Willie usually would look at me and just hold up, what is it, five or six fingers? Huh? Six fingers, which is representing six Super Bowl rings for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Right? <laughs> last year, our Philadelphia Eagles were a mess. They were an absolute mess. And they ended the season four and twelve. They lost 11 out of their last 12 games. One point, they lost eight in a row. The last game of the season, they lost 42 to 7 to the Giants. All right? 42 to 7. They were terrible. It was a mess. So we brought in a new coach. And nobody was feeling like we're going to turn it around. Right? Well, the new coach, everyone, well, you know, who knows what we got on this roster. You'd hear some people call up and I, overreacting. I think there's only two guys that belong on this team. The rest should be cut. And, I mean, that's a little bit of an overreaction. But, but it, was, it was a mess, and the idea was it's going to take us a while to get it back together. And last week, the Eagles flew like Eagles are supposed to fly. On the road to victory, right? But they, the Eagles had an exciting game, right? And what a dramatic change listening to the radio. One guy this year called up and literally he wanted to go through the schedule and explain why he thinks the Eagles could go undefeated this year. And I, whew, it's only happened once in the entire history of the NFL. Not a team that was the mess that the Eagles are, right? But there, but there was this dramatic change. And in Las Vegas, going into the season, the Eagles... Odds of winning the Super Bowl were 50 to 1. And after one game, they were cut to 25 to 1. On the ESPN power rankings, the Eagles moved more than any other team. They jumped up 11 spots. They, in one week, they jumped ahead of 11 other teams that were supposed to be better than them going into the season, right? Everybody had, uh, not maybe not you, but a lot of the, the, the uh, you know, national guys, the Redskins were the team to beat. They're the team that's really been building well, and the Eagles won. And it's exciting, right? But what are we well aware of? One game. <laughs> it's one game, right? One game does not make a season, right? Parents know your child does their chores one time. That doesn't make you happy for the, the, other, you know, the rest of the year, right? One game does not make a season. Okay, those things you did to win, do them again and again and again. Make them a habit, right? 
over and over and over again. In 1 Peter, Peter has been speaking to us about impacting the world around us. And there are some things that he's saying that even today may sound like a repeat. And I have to tell you, hopefully you're not going to think, oh, I'm not going to come if, if next week's a repeat too or, or the week after. That, that there, there's a reason why Peter repeats some things. He's repeating things, some of them for us, in different contexts for a point that we need to live as followers of Jesus daily. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we get off, oh, thank God, we don't have to be Christians on Thursday. No, Thursday, Friday, right? Put that together with the following week and the following year. And he's not talking about us having an undefeated season, but he's saying that there is this sense of what? The Christian life is not a highlight game here and there. Wow, you know, I just... It's, it's this daily lifestyle. And we read about it as he hits the point again, but he's kind of concluding this one section. But he hits it again when we read in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Verse 10, for the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Peter begins by saying to sum up, and so obviously it's what I've been talking about, right? To sum up, he says, all of you, all of you there in, in verse 8. I was watching a documentary about 9-11. It was on 9-11, obviously, this past week. And about what was happening at the Pentagon that day when the terrible attacks took place. And what you had there, the conglomeration of people and ranks and uniforms and, you know, so you had military uniforms and police uniforms and security official uniforms and firemen's uniforms and emergency squad and every, all different types of people and ranks and th situations and, and a lot of heroic effort going on. You had people who were, you know, colonels and majors and, and, and generals grabbing blankets and, and, and you know, wanting to run in and, and rescue people that they knew were still in the building. You had the security officials. You had military intelligence officials. You had all sorts of people doing that. And the scene commander said, at a certain point he realized, I've got to stop people from going in this building. I know there are people in there that are in peril, but this building is... In jeopardy, it's going to come down. I have, as the scene commander, I have to make a command for everybody. And he had, he sent out the command for all of his emergency personnel to line up and block every entrance into the Pentagon. And it was, if you, if you maybe you were there, but if you read about it or seen it, it was confrontational, understandably. And he said at one point there was a high-ranking military official in his face saying, you are a civilian. You are not going to tell me whether I can go in the Pentagon. That's my house. It's not your house. You know, like, I'm, I, in, in a, in a, we know it wasn't in a mean-spirited way. It was, I want to go save my personnel. You are not going to tell me. And he said, yes, I am. And he said, I spoke to generals, to cooks, to intelligence personnel, to military police, security officers, and the word was, all of you, you're not going in the building. And good thing he did, because shortly after, the whole thing collapsed, right? It would have just caused more loss of life. 
Peter says, listen, I've been talking to you about areas in life where there are certainly different roles, different positions. I've been talking to you about your government and your position with government, and, and I've been talking to you about, you know, bosses, masters, and so, you know, servants, and I've been talking to you about marriage, husband, wives. There's different roles and positions. But he says, but, but I'm saying to all of you, you need to live what we looked at a couple weeks ago, the Christian code, right? We saw last week, you need to sound the Christian roar. He says, you have to follow the Christian life. All of you. This, this goes out to, to anybody. No, no matter you know, what your rank, what your place. And so he gives us his message of that, being consistent. And the message, we're going to see the message and then the motivation, and we're kind of going to, the message really comes in, in, in two parts. And the first part is this, live good lives toward other people. Now, the Christian gospel is not live good enough toward other people and you get to heaven. That's the American gospel, right? It's not the Christian gospel. What I mean is the Christian gospel is not do good, do good, do good, and we all... No, the Christian gospel is you cannot do enough good. All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. That's the gospel message. Don't do good things trying to eventually get the badge that says you're allowed into heaven. It's never going to happen. Jesus Christ shed his blood for a reason. If we could earn our way to heaven, God would have never sacrificed his son, right? That Jesus shed his blood, he paid the price for our sin... I absolutely must come and confess my sin to Him and put my trust in Him as my Savior. Then, as a Christian, someone who has been forgiven, someone who has been loved so much by God that I've been given the calling of being His child, as a Christian now, Peter says, I need to live good lives toward other people. He, he gives us, he kind of defines it there in verse 8. Be harmonious. You can't be harmonious if you isolate yourself from the world around you. You can't. Simon and Garfunkel back in, well, 1966 or something, sang these words. A winter's day in a deep and dark December, I am alone Gazing from my window to the streets below on a freshly fallen silent shroud of snow, I am a rock. I am an island. I've built walls, a fortress deep and mighty that none may penetrate. I have no need of friendship. Friendship causes pain, if you had the songs in your head, right? It's laughter and it's loving. I disdain. I am a rock. I am an island. Don't talk of love. But I've heard the words before. It's sleeping in my memory. I won't disturb the slumber of feelings that have died. If I never loved, I never would have cried. I am a rock. I am an island. I have my books and my poetry to protect me. I am shielded in my armor. Hiding in my room, safe within my womb. I touch no one and no one touches me. I am a rock. I am. I'm an island. Peter says, the problem is this. Jesus was not an island. We read over and over of the crowds pressing in on Jesus. All around them so they could barely move, right? And he's touching them. We read of Jesus going to individuals, going to share, going to... He, he was constantly drawing people to himself. He was placing himself into their lives. And Peter says, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you can't be an island either. Now when he says, all of you be harmonious, he isn't saying, you know, get along no matter what anybody believes. No, because you can't be harmonious if you don't agree on, on truth. He's, he's lifting up true doctrine, right? He's lifting up the fact that, you know, what, what do we rally around? That God's Word is absolutely the inspired Word of God. It's inerrant. If somebody comes to me and says, yeah, well, I think there's certain things in the Bible that are true and others that aren't. 
That's going to hinder our harmony, right? I can't just go, oh, well, that's all right. We won't talk about those things that we differ on, right? No, uh, it, there is this, there is good doctrine that unites us. It promotes harmony when we lift up together the inspired Word of God, the truth that Jesus is the only means of salvation, the, the, the truth of, of, you know, the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit, all these different things, they, they promote harmony. So he's not saying be harmonious, just, you know, just, just agree with each other. It's genuine harmony. The point he's getting at is don't be disagreeable people, just to disagree, right? Christians are not supposed to be people that are just constantly disagreeable. Sympathetic, he says. Live good lives to other people, being harmonious, being sympathetic. What does, what does Paul say to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? He says this, When one member of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. The whole body suffers. Now sometimes that doesn't happen because... You're suffering in silence. And, and you're not telling anybody. <laughs> and that's what we've said before. This is supposed to be a safe place where you can share your hurts and sufferings and find ways to, 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 be, to, to grow that way with one another. It may have been last night at the rodeo, you were sitting down next to someone and they found out one of the things that's causing you pain and they're able to care, right? But that's what Peter says. You'd better care. That's what Paul says, because if one member of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. In Romans chapter 12, Paul says what? Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That, 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 let it be real. Let your lives be touched, right? Let your lives be touched. Let it, let it affect you, right? You know, I know in life, sometimes somebody may be sharing a story with you, and, it, uh, and as you're sharing it, you're, you're thinking, oh, this story is gross. Now, oh, I'm not listening anymore. I'm not listening. And, 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 and that's okay. But, you know, Peter's not saying, you have to listen, you know, whatever details they're giving you. But he is saying, don't let it be where you're like, oh, no, that person's suffering with something that I don't want to think about. And you shut them off. No, it, let, it, let it touch you. And it may make you have to deal with some hidden fears, but let it touch you. Be sympathetic. Be harmonious. Be sympathetic. He says brotherly, and the word there obviously is a reference to that brotherly love, right? That men and women and, you know, can, can, can promote. That sense of, of community. Jesus didn't do things by accident. And in John chapter 13, we saw last week about him washing the disciples' feet. He put it in a context of the disciples being sitting around a table, right? Reclining around a table. They're looking at each other. He knows he's about to go to the cross. This is an important time. And he has built an absolute... I mean, he's a master communicator, Jesus. And he has set the dynamics that they are in a circle around the table, right? Looking at each other as he talks. And as he says, love one another as I have loved you. They're seeing him. They're seeing each other. As a matter of fact, we even read side comments going on. Is he talking about me? Is he talk Who, who's he talking about? What's that? Was he looking at me? You know, they're, they're intermingled. It's a one. Jesus has called them together as a community Look at each other. Brotherly love. He intentionally positioned them that way. So harmonious and sympathetic and brotherly, kind-hearted, right? Which is kindness coming from the heart, right? It's not external. Um, I, you know, Bob Dow Sandro so faithfully. Bob, for so many years, you know, led, led, led the primary department, and I had the opportunity for some of those years to be in there together with him, and, and uh, we would sing a, a particular song. Be ye kind, be ye kind, be ye kind to one another. You know, primary song, right? And some of you maybe sang that in that department, right? Be ye kind to one another. And I remember one specific Sunday morning, 
as I was, I don't know if I was playing the piano at the time, leading that song or whatever, and as we're singing, starting to play, Be Ye Kind, I see one little boy drops his paper. And the boy next to him sees it on the floor, puts his foot on it. And we start singing, and he's singing, Be Ye Kind, Be Ye Kind. And the kid's going, Hey, give me my paper. And he's, Be Ye Kind to one another. Right? <laughs> And, and it is because we, oh, kids are so cute. No, it's us, right? Be ye kind. You know, and, 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 and while, you know, while we're, you know, got them in the headlock, you know, be ye kind to one another. And, and, and Peter's saying it's a kindness that has to come from the heart, right? That, that, that when it doesn't flow that way, oh, it just... It's, it's just words that are eventually are going to, there's eventually going to be that, that, that straw that breaks the camel's back and tips us over, right? K- kindness from the heart. He says, and humble in spirit. The, the, your translation may even say mind there, because there is a sense that he's giving here of, of a, a spirit, a mentality that is friendly, that is inviting others close. The reference here to humble in spirit, he's going to tell us in other places that humility before God, and that's where it begins, but this is a reference in in our dealings with others. That being humble in spirit, and the way that it invites others close. And that's what verse 8 is about. When he's saying to us, live good lives toward others, it's these qualities of life that, 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 that have such a dynamic about them. This week when I was working on the sermon, and I, sometimes, I'm, as I've said to you before, I'm going from one this, visiting this person or going here, and in between, I always have my books with me in case oh, there's going to be 15 minutes in between and maybe I'll stop at Dunkin' Donuts or, you know. And so I was. I was in Dunkin' Donuts. And, um, and, I'm, and as I was in there and I'm looking over and I'm literally going over these, this particular verse and, and, you know, these qualities. And the words, the song that came on the radio were this. Here's my story. It's sad but true. It's about a girl that I once knew. She took my love, then ran around right, with every single guy in town. And you can start the chorus. Right? Hey, no, not really. We're gonna... <laughs> but he goes on to say what? Keep away from run around Sue. You may say, I, I, I don't like that song because it's usually guys that are doing that. Girls aren't, you know. But, but the point is he's saying what? Here's somebody who violated all those things. They were not harmonious or sympathetic or brotherly or kind-hearted. And what was the result? It's repelling. Keep away. Peter says, what I'm telling you is supposed to be just the opposite. When you read about Jesus, do you realize that Jesus, people were drawn to him. They were drawn to him. Scripture tells us he went about doing good. And people were drawn to him because of it. You may say, what are you talking about? He was crucified. Yeah, not everybody, right? But people that w- were drawn to Jesus because of that, the way he lived. Peter says, live like that. Live good lives toward other people. The second part of his message kind of is this, even if they're not. Because what does he say in verse 9? Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. It's not a message to police officers, to the army, right? There's no principle here that I'm a police officer and I arrive on the scene of somebody who is robbing my house or your house and, and, well, I need to bless them. Here, do you want to use my car to get away? Because you... You know, that, that, forget about that if you're thinking, wait a minute, how does this apply? Is he trying to say what we should do with Syria or not do with Syria? It has nothing to do with the United States and Syria. That's a, 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 a government responding, okay? It, it has to do, this is, he's not talking to government's use of their armies. 
if you want to you know, debate that, that's, that's a different time. He's talking here about our personal lives. This is personal. And that's when it's hard, right? It's a lot easier when I'm talking about the government, what the government should do, what the police should do. But when it's someone insulting me, what a difference his words can be when he says, retaliate with blessing. He doesn't say don't retaliate, in essence. He says retaliate with blessing, <laughs> right? I mean, you imagine the impact if tomorrow at your place of employment, somebody looked at you and said, you know what, I can't stand you. I've got to be honest with you. I can't stand you. I hate everything about you. I think you're such a loser. I'm going to do everything I can to get you fired. Oh, really? Right? My response, oh, yeah? Well, let me tell you something because I want you to know how I feel. You imagine the difference of saying, wow, you know what? I'll be honest, those words hurt me. If you were trying to hurt me, yeah, th- those words hurt, but I want you to know this. I still value you and I, I you know, I care about you. you. Imagine the difference. You may say, it wouldn't make any difference with this person I'm talking about, and maybe it wouldn't. But my point is, Peter is saying to us, live good lives toward other people even if they're not. Retaliate with blessing. We know what a difference it would make in our own homes even, let alone with the world outside around us. Peter's message is live good lives toward other people, even if they're not. And then he, I believe he gives us motivation, and I'm going to list two motivations as well. And the first one you may or may not agree with, but give me a moment. The first one is this, general peace in life. In other words, Peter, I believe one of the things he's going to say that I believe Scripture points us to, generally speaking, living a good life toward others will position you, generally speaking, okay, just but follow me, toward more peaceful life. For what does he say there in verse 10? And this is a quote out of Psalms. For the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. There are verses in the Old Testament that talk to us about how we can live long lives, and we know it's not an absolute guarantee. We know that. When a Christian dies at a young age, we don't think, well, that's because they weren't living the way they were supposed to. You know, we don't, you know there, there are things that cause that. My heart was broken this week. And I mean that genuinely. Again, as I officiated a funeral of a, of a young man who was born around the same time my son was born. And he lost his life to heroin this week. And it's, you know, there are, there are realities. And, and Peter says to us, this is not a, a universal guarantee, but I believe it's a general principle. If you desire to have peaceful, friendly relationships, then you be peaceful and friendly. Now, you may say, wait a minute, don't you realize some of the... Look, they, 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 look what they did to Jesus and Paul and... Absolutely. Persecution will come. Persecution will come. But if persecution comes, let it come directly because of your faithfulness to the message of gospel, your faithfulness to living the life that Jesus would have you live. Persecution will come. Bullies will take advantage. Mean people will mistreat good people. Persecution will come, but let it be for the right reason. It's not persecution if you caused it. And I think that's one of the things Peter's saying. You know, we are in a church soccer league, and I realize everybody on every one of the teams in that church soccer league are not believers. But if in that church soccer league 
before every game, they're beginning in prayer, and they're, you know, they're, you know, talking. To somebody's on different people on the teams are trying to witness to the officials or something, you know. And if I'm an official, and during that church soccer game, I am being constantly insulted and bickering and nang and nang, complaining, and their teams are, 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 you know, when this person feels like they were mistreated, they're dirt, doing dirty plays to take this person down. There's retaliation going on everywhere and if at the end of that season when I've watched these people bicker and complain and be cruel and retaliate if at the end I have some negative things to say about followers of Jesus that's not persecution that is not persecution that's us violating what Peter told us to live good lives toward others Scott McKnight, in his commentary, shares these words. The gentleness of Peter's exhortations are fundamental to how Christians are to relate to the outside world. We ought not to be known for fighting and quarreling, nor ought we to become an unruly mob that is always agitating for one thing or another. Now, McKnight is not saying, and nor is Peter saying, that as Christians we shouldn't stand up and speak in a, in a nation where we have the freedom to speak, to stand up for moral things. He's not saying that we, you know, don't, don't go misquote what's being said. He's not saying we, we shouldn't stand up and seek, you know, justice and seek, you know, right things. What he's saying is, is this. Christians aren't supposed to be seen as people who are always miserable and angry and ready to pick a fight. If you're always trying to pick a fight, don't be surprised when you get punched. Right? Seriously. I mean, he says that. If you desire a good life and good days, it's not a universal guarantee, but if, generally speaking, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil. Do good. Seek peace. You know, this, this, this general motivation that he calls us to. Because why? That lifestyle is the lifestyle that is going to get you the opportunity, if there's to be an opportunity, to share the gospel. It's not going to come by demanding people to listen to you. It's going to come by that. And that's why Paul, to, to the Romans, what does Paul say? Paul says, and Paul, Paul stood for truth. Paul was ready to confront error. But what does he say? You know, it, it, you know as much as lies within you, you know, as, far, as, as much as you can, as much as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Provide that atmosphere where you are trying to be harmonious and sympathetic and, and loving and kind-hearted and humble that, that is going to provide that opportunity. We're going to see you know, in, in the coming verses being ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. But that's, that comes out of what? That comes out of living a life like Jesus. And Peter says, you live that way. And it, it's, it, it, is, is it a guarantee? No. Things could turn quickly and it could just simply be if you hold to the name of Jesus, it doesn't matter if you're the nicest person in the world. If you're standing for biblical truth, you are going to be public enemy. But what he says is, live the way Jesus lived. Live that way with each other. Don't be looking to pick a fight. The greatest motivation, of course, is not general peace. It's God's presence. Because he says in verse 12, For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. And his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Remembering that as we're living this way, that God is always present. You know, it's it's a recurring kind of thing in different movies and stuff, right? You know, even, you know, in The Lion King, right? Simba is out there struggling. And there's Mufasa in the sky watching him, right? 
Simba, you know, and he's talking to him. Okay, I, you, you know, he's there watching and Star Wars, right? The end, the return of the Jedi and the music's playing and there's Luke and he looks up and there is, you know, Anakin, his father, you know, now standing with Yoda and Obi-Wan Kenobi and, you know, ah. Listen, God is in the room all the time. He's in every situation. And Peter says, that's why you pursue being harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly love, right? Kind-hearted, humble in spirit. That's why when somebody insults you, you seek to respond with a blessing. Because God is watching and He's listening. That's our greatest motivation. See, Peter began these words tonight by saying, today by saying what? To sum up. Let me sum up. Because he's been talking about this theme of our focus, right? Is it on how others are treating me or is it on how God would have me treat others? He's trying to pull our lifestyle up out of the muck that the world settles for. And he's trying to call us to a standard of living that, you know what, will bring you more joy as you live that way for others. He's saying, impact the lives around you because you have no idea the influence you're making. A couple weeks ago, I was sitting in the diner in the morning, and I don't think I've shared this on Wednesday night, I'm not sure, but I was sitting in the diner, and I was kind of reading scripture, uh, and I saw a, a gal come in who looked to be about my daughter Deanna's age, like 22 years old. She was in a wheelchair. It was very clear her legs did not move. Her one arm didn't move. Her body was affected in, in different ways, and her one arm moved a bit, and with that she controlled the chair. She could move her head. And as she went by me, as I saw her go by me, my response was... Oh, Lord, Lord, thank you that my daughters can run and dance and play the piano and get in their car and drive somewhere. And all, Lord, thank you. Oh, Lord, thank you. All the things in life that we can be. Well, what about that? Are we going to get a job? Are we going to do this? Thank you, Lord. And my next response, and, and, and you, you know, you can... You, you know, my response is to be yours. You may say, you know, have a problem with my response. I'm being honest with you as I sat there. Not a lot of time went by. That was my first response. My next response, and some of you may think this is just bizarre, but it's just part of... I just said to the Lord, Lord, if this is one of those moments in life that, I'm, that, that you want to tell me to go over to her, put my hand on her and pray for healing, then you make that clear. You tell me that. Because I, I, I had a sense that this person, just from what I was watching, don't think that some miracle occurred. If you're waiting for this to really, I didn't read about this in the paper. Wait a minute, you know, don't, you know. Um, I just had a sense that this, this, this was somebody, it was either a car accident, spinal meningitis, something that had, just about this girl, that this wasn't from birth. I have no idea. But that was my prayer. And as I was saying that, Lord, if you would want me, as I was saying that, the Lord wanted something totally different. Because you know what? As I'm saying it, I heard her laughter as she laughed. I looked over as she's smiling. She's talking to her sister or friend, whoever it is. And she's talking about 
what was going to be happening in her life that day. And, she, and the waitress came over, and she's being gracious and kind. and cur- just She's treating this waitress in such a loving, respectful manner. And I sat there and thought, wow, Lord. Wow. What an impact on me. I'm looking at this girl and saying, oh, Lord, you know, what an impact on me the way she was living. And I just said, Lord, thank you. Thank you for even stopping me in the midst of my prayer and so loudly showing me the impact of a life. That's what Peter's saying. Listen, impact your world as a follower of Jesus Christ. You only get so many days on earth to do it. Impact your world as a follower of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for the way that you work in our lives. Oh Lord, help us to make a 180 if that's what we need to do. If we're stomping our foot, if we're stepping down hard on that piece of paper, if we're demanding the right to retaliate to that person with causing them greater pain than they caused us, Lord, turn us 180 degrees. Whatever you need to turn us, whether it be 10 degrees. Turn our hearts, O God. We are not islands. Our lives are impacting others. Let it be, O Lord, for your glory. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.